Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Earthworks Podcast. I'm Kevin Hicks, the Western Regional Agronomist for Earthworks. And this week, I'm excited to uh, be talking with Mr. Travis Blaymeyers. He's the Director of Agronomy at Tonto Verde Golf Course in Rio Verde, Arizona. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, uh, kind of covered his travels through his career path, and also uh, uh, really excited to talk about some of the issues that he's dealt with with respect to sodium uh, at his current stop and some of the creative and, and innovative ways that he's chosen to deal with it. Um, stay tuned. We, we cover a lot of ground, but, uh, I think you'll enjoy today's talk and, uh, and thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you get our weekly updates. Uh, we, uh, we release a new podcast interview every Tuesday morning. Thanks again and, uh, enjoy. I'm uh, I'm here with Travis Blamires, the director of agronomy at Tonto Verde uh, Golf Course down in uh, Rio Verde. Is it Rio Verde or Tonto Verde? It's it's we're Tonto Verde Golf Club in Rio Verde, Arizona. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, so welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I promise you, we'll 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 get this in and get you back out in the in the sun as soon as possible. But uh, really appreciate you taking the time, and I kind of. Uh, for those of you listening, I, I prepared a few questions so that I didn't catch them off guard, but, uh, hopefully it'll be a good conversation about some things that, um, that you guys deal with in Arizona that, that a lot of other people in the country don't even think about. So, um, thanks for coming and, uh, wanted to start off, uh, you, you're, you're an under the radar kind of superintendent always have been. And so I'm going to put you on the spot and have you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you where you've been, where you're from. I know the story, but uh, you know, for those those of the, those of the folks that are listening, let's, let's tell us a little about yourself. Well, thanks for having me. You know, this is interesting media. Um, hopefully, it goes one way. But originally, I'm from Southern Idaho, a small town named Drome. You know, hour and a half south of Boise. I started working on a golf course when I was 14 because I didn't want to work for my dad, who was a, a plumber ex excavator. <laughs> um, just didn't want to take the family business up. So worked on a golf course while I was going to high school. It was going to be a, a, a wildlife biology when I got out of high school. So, you know, continuing to work on the golf course, I moved up to Boise to go to Boise State to continue my biology degree. Um, I worked at Hillcrest Country Club one for Clint Travis for a few years and then for Kevin Hicks for the, the last couple of years. Um, you know, I still wanted to be a wildlife biology biologist, but both, both Kevin and Clint said, you know, you should go to school for turf. I'm like there's a school for turf. And I didn't <laughs> think anything of it. Just, just a grass farmer, I guess. So, you know, time goes on and I get into Penn state from the help of both Kevin and Clint. Um, and it was an eye opener for, for what, I was used to, you know, working on the crew. I, I pretty much was an irrigation tech and I still enjoy doing irrigation to this day. You know, it must come from my dad being a plumber, but you know, that's the main part of a golf course is the irrigation system. And you want that thing running as good as you can. That's right. So, you know, working at Hillcrest, you know, that's pretty much all I did was other than running equipment is <clears throat> we're in the irrigation and the first course I worked at, Drum Country Club, just a small 18-hole course, you know, I did everything. There were eight of us on the crew to maintain the entire golf course. In the winter, we were mechanics. And when the superintendent wasn't there, we were mechanics, we were irrigation guys. I mean, we just did it all. And it just opens your eyes the amount of work that goes into a golf course, you know, to, to make it what people see on TV or, or wherever they see it. Yeah. And, but, and, uh, and no better way to get your feet wet than to just jump in and do it all, right? Yeah, I mean, you learn a lot by doing it yourself. And there's really, you know, with a small crew like that, nobody's really showing you what to do. You're just doing what you think's right. And fortunately, it worked out. But, uh, you know, I met my wife and is from the same town I'm from, but I didn't know her in high school because she's older than me by two years. But uh, oh, she's you're been with me. That one. You're going to pay for that. Oh, I know. <laughs> still young, though. Yeah. <laughs> but she's been with me, you know. We've been together 27 years. Um, she, she pretty much knows what I do. 
but uh, we've been this year will be 20 years being married and she's traveled the country with me going to different golf courses that I get transferred to. Um, I don't think I'd have it any other way. You know, I still like to be a biologist, but those jobs are hard to find anymore. Yeah. But being a superintendent, you're a biologist in itself to man- managing living, breathing turf. So, so but, you, uh, your specific degree, your first degree is in ornithology, right? I took an ornithology class. I mean, that was kind of my passion, but my specific degree is a bachelor's of science in biology. And I okay. have one class away from a minor, minor in chemistry. Got it. I know we used to, we used to tease you when you were at Hillcrest that you were going to be the, the bird doctor or something. And, and, uh, yeah, I was just curious about that. Well, that's cool. So what, so, no, I, so you leave Hillcrest, you go to Penn state. Uh, and, and I know I, I kind of, maybe forced your hand a little bit as to where to go do an internship and get some, some experience. So, so talk about that a little bit. Yeah. When I was working for you at Hillcrest, you, you had just started there. And I think that winter you took me and the, the mechanic down to Arizona just to, you know, I guess you wanted to go back and see the place and I guess introduce me to some people and a different way of thinking because in the Northwest it's beautiful and it's nice, but it's not the desert <laughs> Southwest. So it kind of opened my eyes, you know, what's out there because I was, you know, first starting out in the industry, you're mowing rough or something. You're thinking, you know, how, how can you go further? Do you see the masters on TV? Like, yeah, I'd like to work there someday. Um, But coming down to the Southwest, when you brought us down here, like I said, it opened some eyes. So, you know, I, I chose to do my internship in Arizona. I didn't want to go back to Idaho or go somewhere. I'm just going to sit on a hose all, all summer long. When I came to Arizona, I interned at True North. And at the time, there were no superintendents on the staff. It was the director of agronomy and two assistants and myself. So I had free reign on the place, yeah. which really helped me out, you know, with Troon Golf down the road. Yeah, for sure. So you did, you did a one, uh, a, a season internship there, finish up at yeah, school. Yeah, go back to, finish up at school. And, you know, I was offered jobs in Colorado and in California and, you know, they just didn't feel right you know, cause you're, you're down in the winter, you're trying to find things to do or California has its own issues, but I decided to go back to true North because, you know, it was offered to me. Uh, I knew the property. I knew that there was advancement in the company with true golf because at the time they were small. You know, they were probably one of the smaller management companies at the time and they wouldn't take on a property unless they had the people to move. So I went back to, to true North work for Ed Shimkus for, I think two years. Yeah. And then he, decided to move on and, and Scott and air comes in, which, you know, Ed, Ed's a guy that can grow grass and Scott's a guy that can run numbers. So to, to see the, the two of those guys and how they run their operation differently, you yeah. know, kind of helped me going down the road and, you know, Scott promoted me to, to lead us to lead superintendent over both golf courses at true North why I was waiting for a, a job to open up for me. And it came a year later. I, I got transferred down to San Diego, which, you know, the property was great, but it's just too big of a city to live in when you're from a small town in Idaho. Yeah, for sure. So that was early 2000s, right? That was, I got transferred to San Diego in 2004. Okay. Yeah. And I was only there 18 months because Scott at true north decided to move on and he recommended me for running true north and if anybody knows true north it's it's a beautiful property but there's a lot of moving parts to that being yeah. that you know the corporate office is right down the road but that's it, right i mean i was there for eight years and there was a lot that went on there yeah you truly have big brothers staring right right over your shoulder all the time but what a great opportunity for for a guy who's just a couple of years out of school so it speaks volumes for what yeah. you're capable of doing yeah, I mean, it was fun. And then, you know, time goes by and we have a kid and we thought it'd be fun to move back home as in Idaho, you know, so I, I talked to Jeff Spangler and said, you know, if you have anything that comes open in Idaho, I'd be interested. He says, well, we do in Sun Valley. I'm like, sign me up because Sun Valley is an hour away from where I grew up. Right. But right. lo and behold, it's, it's not always good to go back home when you've <laughs> been away for so long because, you know, everybody's in your business. Yeah. But, yeah, you, but Elkhorn you, was a great property. And you were there for just a few years, right? I was there for, I believe, four and a half years. Um, okay. And that was right during the downturn, right? 
Yeah, right during the downturn, and you know, you you couldn't sell a house if you were giving it away. So you know, we we struggled, but we made it through. Um, it's it's weird going from you know your desert southwest back to Idaho, and the sun never sets in the summer pretty much. So I mean, people are golfing at eleven o'clock at night, and you're wondering why the golf course is getting tore up. Well, they're <laughs> exactly. out there all day. <laughs> but then the winters are different. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I got the itch. You know, I, I couldn't stand not doing anything in the winter. I'm a, I'm a guy that doesn't really sit in an office. I sit on a mower or something to, to keep busy. So I had to, I had to move on. So we moved back down to California to Palm Springs to the club at Morningside, which it was a great property. It was Jack Nicholas's first signature course he did in the desert. Um, just a hundred and I think it was 170 acres of wall to wall turf, common Bermuda. Bent grass greens in the desert. Well, I think we were one of eight courses with bent grass at the time. But and the kicker was is we planted when we plant like eighty thousand plots of annual flowers every year. Yeah, and that amazing made the annual course planting. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a headache though. I I hope I never have to do horticulture because those things are so time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the work, the work definitely paid off because every time I visited, it was absolutely gorgeous and, and not just bent grass, Travis. I mean, it was pen cross bent grass. And I, I think we'll get back to that a little bit later, but, um, I, I remember the first time I came to visit you and I think it was during the GIS event and, and drove out to see you. And, uh, I've never seen pen cross look that clean, pure and, and tight. I mean, it was a, that was a pretty uh, a pretty big eye opener for me as to how you could manage some of those older bents really really well. I know it's not that case anymore. That they're uh, did they did they convert to Bermuda? I they converted they a couple to years. Hip Dwarf the year after I left. You know, I I set the groundwork for them to convert, and they yeah. finally did it. Um, but you know, having Ben Grass at that not only that elevation but that climate, you know. In the summer, it was definitely a headache when you put out 70 fans. And if you step outside in the morning and it, and it smells like the salt and sea, you know you're going to have issues that day. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, the, the members knew, you know, going into it, what they got themselves into and come over seating when the golf course was still being grown in. The greens were always rolling at 11. So that's all they cared about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good membership, too, from what I remember. They treated, they treated yeah. Older well. membership, a really good membership. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a connection to Hillcrest there. I think was how you got in, and how one of the previous superintendents, Eric Poles, had gotten in, and uh, so that's that's neat. It's a small business for sure. It is a small business. Yeah. So what? Uh, tell me about passions outside of work. What do you What are you into? What do you do besides uh, chasing your kids all over the place? And we like to go. We go camping. I mean, camping's not the same in Arizona as in Idaho, but it's good to get out of out of Phoenix every once in a while. Go up north. Flagstaff or Payson. Um, we're trying to venture into Colorado one of these days, but you know, my kids, uh, my son's 11, my daughter will be 15 this year. She's itching to start driving, but we're not itching to get her a car. <laughs> but uh, you know, besides work and chasing kids all over the place, you know, my, me and my son ride dirt bikes, and the family we ride uh, mountain bikes. And we just try to to be outside as much as we can, yeah. and even though it's hot. You get used to it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it. Well, it's like anywhere. It's it's a great climate for about nine or ten months out of the year, and then you just got to gut it out for the two months. It's just not winter; it's summer, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So you said yeah, earlier we, we have. We, go ahead. Excuse me. Yeah, we have, we have we have winter, a little bit of spring, and then all summer. We don't really yeah. have a fall or anything, but it's it's you get used to it. Yeah, it's uh, and and fall unfortunately occurs right after you've dropped all your all your ryegrass overseed, and and it happens in about two days, doesn't it? That's correct. <laughs> so you said you just started listening to podcasts. Are you a reader, or do you do you just keep your head down and and do stuff with the family? I'm not so much of a reader. You know, we we're on you know mobile devices or electronics quite a bit, but you know I. I haven't really listened to the podcast, but uh, I listened, started listening a couple weeks ago from, from the Jingweeds. It's my neighbor and another guy down the street. You know, they're just, they talk about golf course stuff, but they also talk about sports and, you know, whatever comes in their mind. And it, it just kind of 
opens you up, you know, not always listening to the radio or, or music yeah. or anything, just something else to listen to. Yeah, they're doing a nice job. With kind that. of like Twitter is. Twitter, you know, you pick up a lot of things from Twitter from different guys around the country. And, you know, that's, I, I think that's the way the podcasts are looking to come, too. You're just listening to the different perspectives. I agree. It's really, it's shrunk our world of turf grass a lot and, and brought us, I think, a lot closer together and just great sharing of ideas for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple of suggestions that you'll really enjoy, but we'll, we'll do that off air, I guess. Um, All right. Okay. So let's, let's talk about Tunnel Verde. So you get, you, you arrive at Tunnel Verde, uh, what, how many years ago? Five years ago. Okay. Jeez. Unbelievable. So it is, it goes fast. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, again, I know a little bit of the backstory on the, on the property. Um, but this is really kind of the meat of what I wanted to talk about today and, and, and get into some of the things. Cause you know, you, you get, you get into the East coast and the Midwest where the rainfall is fairly plentiful and it comes at in, in timely intervals. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily, I know there's, there's guys I've talked to, uh, who, you know, they've, they've used, uh, almost 20 million gallons of water in a year. And, you know, you think about that conversely to, to what you guys do in Arizona. Uh, you know, you literally are living and dying by water, um, by irrigation. And, and uh, so you, you step foot on the property. There were some challenges to begin with. Um, and, and you really took from, from the get-go, you took a different tack. And uh, so, so talk about that with, re- with respect to salts and some of the conditions that you, that you walked into and, and, you know, how, not necessarily how, how they got there, but how you were looking at things differently and, and wanted to try to remedy things long-term. Yeah. I mean, if anybody's familiar with the, I guess it's the North Scottsdale corridor, you know, we grow grass on what I would call if I was back home is pea gravel. It's, it's basically decomposed granite. There's no real structure to it. It's just parent material that's sitting on the ground. It, in its nature, it's salty. Right. And you throw on top of that, the river that runs next to us is the Salt River. You know, I never put two and two together for a few <laughs> years. You know, why is our water so bad? And one guy at the water district says, well, it is the Salt River. So you, you kind of put two and two together. But I knew coming into this job that they had issues because True North is 10 miles up the road, and we had the same issues up there. Granted, they were a little worse up there at the time, I believe, but... You know, I knew what I was getting myself into. I get on property in February and, you know, you're, you're driving around and you're, you're seeing what's going on and, you know, you know what's going on because you've dealt with it before. But, you know, the first thing any person should do and the first thing I did was pull soil samples and they come back and you're just, you're sitting there like, all right, so what are we going to do? And the first thing you notice is the pH was five to four and a half. I'm like, well, that's not going to work going forward. I mean, you know, the ryegrass loves low pH, Bermuda grass, you know, not at all. So right. you know, we, we didn't fertilize the entire first year I was here because we didn't need to. There was enough nitrogen in the soil to keep things moving. And I knew that summer was going to be just horrendous for transition. And sure enough, I mean, we were bare dirt, pretty much 75% of the property. Um, you know, our water source is a mixture of non-potable water, which comes from uh, a couple wells above the river. And then for the winter, when we, when we have members here, we're supplied with effluent. There's times during the year that I would rather take the effluent than the non-potable water. And we test it pretty regularly, and it's got no less than 1,300 TDS mainly sodium that we're putting out on the golf course nightly. Right. I can't remember the pound per acre we're doing, but you know, you can't fix that because there's three users on the system and they're not going to put in an RO plant for it. Sure. So we're on our own. Um, they said they don't have to supply water to us, but they do because, you know, we do things with it and the effluent as well. So that's, I mean, that's the challenge we're faced with is, you know, the main input we put on the golf course is horrible. But, uh, <laughs> that's and you, and you do it a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. We don't water as much as people think we do. Yeah, we do put a lot of water out, but, you know, the 36 holes that we have here, I think one course is smaller than another, but we probably average 350,000 gallons a night uh, right now because our, our 
uh, ETs are really high. Our uh, uh, humidity is really low. But once we start getting into the monsoon season in July, we might use 200 to 250 a night. Our biggest time of using water is the most important is when we're dropping seed. We're probably yep. putting out a million gallons a day. Right, and, right. You know, so just think so about dumping a salt shaker. Yeah. So when so back up for a minute when you when you say because again I think this is something a lot of people don't understand if they haven't been through it. But when you say ETs are high, explain that. What what's what's your number? We you know right like what's now, a, what's what's a day ETs where are, you know you're gonna you're gonna really have to have to make up some ground. I think our average ETs right now are 0.3 to 0.33. Right. So we might do 70 to 80 percent of ET. We can go out at 100 percent ET because one, it's going to you know sink the boat as far as money, but two, our soils don't take the water. Right. There's nowhere for it to go because they're so locked up with salt. Yeah. So you know we we probably two five two six. If we know it's going to be windy and the course is closed, we'll probably go to a two nine, but we never go above point three because we know what it's going to do the next day. Exactly. And You're not I have a playable the surface. Course is, yeah. The course is closed from May 15th through November 1st. We're one golf course. The, the membership has allowed the summer for maintenance activity. So we close one golf course for a month and then we rotate that through the summer. So we, we have the time we need to get the job done because the membership understands that things have to be done to make the golf course good for the fall. Yeah. Cause that's where you're making your money, right? That's when your members are there. That's when, that's when the ryegrass is down. It's, you know, I always called it our cash crop. The, the, the perennial ryegrass that goes down in the winter time is, is truly your cash crop, right? Correct. And you know, this year's different you know, everybody knows COVID going on. So people are sticking around more. Right. We're, we're averaging 350 to 450 rounds a day when we had two golf courses. Well, now we're, combining all those golfers onto one golf course and they're trying to figure out why you know why we can't drive on the car path every other day yeah because you know we're trying to protect the bermuda grass because bermuda is where the ryegrass lives and they're all split up in four carts too aren't they yeah four or five carts per group and they can't figure out where all the traffic's coming from because yeah. there's less people in town that everybody has to have their own cart now yeah Pri- private clubs have and had social distancing and and the, what what was that I don't see single riders going away anytime soon. No, I, I was just going to say that private clubs are, uh, they've had the social distancing thing figured out for a long time, especially clubs where they own their own cards. <laughs> so yeah. I think you're right. I think that's going to be something we're, we're dealing with in the long term for sure. But to get back to the salt issue, uh, there's, there's times if we don't get rain, you can drive the golf course. And not so much on the turf side of the cart path, but the, the desert side of the cart path. You can go out there and harvest salt and put it on your stakes that night. It, right. it, you know, it's, it's a dry, humid climate. So anything that the water that sits evaporates and then you get the salt left behind. And, you know, I've got pictures of just white powder on the side of the cart path that, you know, and we grow grass on it. Right. So it, it, it's an issue that's not going to go away. But I think we may be on the right path to we're not going to ever fix it, but we're managing it. Um, and not with chemicals as was suggested in years past. So, so explain that let's, let's get into that. Cause I think this is really the the crux of the conversation and, and how you've approached things differently. And, you know, you weighed dollars and cents, you weighed, uh, interruption to the, to the members and, and, and started on a program a couple of years ago that, you know, in my estimation, seeing the golf course is really, has really benefited and will in the long term. What, what have you done? Well, as I said, when I got on property, the pH is four and a half to five. Well, you know, that's from excess ammonium sulfate and sulfur. You know, right. There's really no textbook on how to manage salt in the desert Southwest. There's really no professors dealing with it. Every class I've taken in the past, you know, you need to water and throw gypsum, throw water and more gypsum. Well, you can only throw so much gypsum and we don't get any water because it's all salty water. Right. So, you know, the message I get from those professors is good luck. So <laughs> that tells me that, you know, there's no help out there. We've got to do it all ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, we didn't fertilize the first year. I still maintain the gypsum applications as recommended by soil test, but we knew it wasn't doing anything because we already had 70% base saturation calcium on our soil test, but the sodium 
is 21% on average. So you know, we can't get rid of that sodium with the water source. So I was leaning on my Brookside guy. He, Fred Astrom, you know, he comes over here twice a year, full samples. He's been coming over here as long as I have. And he's seen the changes. He kept recommending, you know, you've got to keep throwing or you've got to start throwing sand. I'm like, yeah, you know, we're, we're doing an eighth of inch a year. Is that not good enough? He says, no, you need to go, you need to step it up. So, you know, I was committed to the eighth inch. Um, I was on a golf, on one of the golf courses over the summer, I think my first year here. And I was talking to a, a member who in essence was a math major. He, I said, yeah, we're, we're going to stay committed to an eighth of an inch a year. And he goes, well, wh- where do you want to end up? So we like six to eight inches. So he goes, well, that's going to take you 64 years. I'm like, and, <laughs> and I'll, and I'll be dead before then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be dead. You'll be dead. You won't see your investment. And the average age of the golfer here at, at Tono Verde is 72. So right. these, this, these members, they want to see their investments sooner than later. So, you know, I, I kind of took to heart what Fred had been telling me. So I think the first thing we did is I, I got a hold of a, a dealer here that sells shockwaves. And I said, you know, we'd, we'd like to demo one of your units. So he brings out a brand new shockwave. Uh, if anybody knows what that is, it's a linear decompactor that goes behind a tractor. Uh, it, it really creates a mess, but in, in the long term, it's good. So he comes out with a brand new unit. And I was telling him, you know, you're going to go to the worst hole on the property. It's hard as a rock. Um, good luck. He goes, oh, this machine will get right through it. <laughs> he goes out there, comes back four hours later, and he goes, man, you've got some bad soils. I even got some wear on my machine. I said, what did I tell you? So, you know, we really didn't see anything that year from, you know, going in there one direction. But come the next spring, you know, that hole was a little bit better. So, you know, talking with Fred, he goes, you need to start injecting sand. So I hemmed and hawed and thought about it. And I finally went to the Greens Committee and said, look, we can either do the shockwave and, and top dress on top of it, or we can go get a black. You know, a black is the same machine, except they're injecting sand. Right. So got a hold of a, a vendor here in town that has a black. He came out and we did number six again, four directions. Uh, I think we put an inch of sand out over those four directions. And it looked like Swiss cheese. I mean, I didn't think anything was going to come back. And lo and behold, we decided we we timed it just right during monsoon. If anybody's familiar with monsoon in the, the desert, we get high humidities and the temperature goes down a little bit. But that's what the Bermuda thought thrives on is humidity. And we did the black during that and it was healed within a week. I mean, you could still see the line, but the, the grass was growing. It was healthy. And... You know, the year prior, if it was to rain on that hole, well, it rains on the whole property, but that hole in particular, we couldn't drive a car on it for a week. Well, we got a rainstorm that summer, and I was just out checking things, and you know, we could have drove a car on it right away because even though we're only getting four to six inches depth on the, the black, you know, we're putting that much sand in. It's wicking the water away from the surface, and it's following those channels to lower areas and to drain. So we knew something was on the right path. And that hole itself for overseed was probably, it went from worst to first. And the next summer, they had already decided to do the entire golf course, uh, the ranch course, because it was the worst of the two. Um, so we're, we're on a, a pretty consistent top dressing program on fairways during the summer. Uh, last summer, we put out 4,500 tons of sand. This summer, we're going to do the same. We're going to black the second golf course in four directions in July. Um, and I've, I've told the Greens Committee and the board, and they're all on board, you know, as long as I'm here and as long as we're seeing positive movement, we're going to continue to throw sand um, for the future at a half an inch. And we've talked about, so you, so going back to the number six trial, you, you said you put almost an inch of sand on, but that's not even including what was put down in the in the channels, correct? No, that's just surface top dressing in the right. channels, you know, depending on the area, it was four to six inches in depth. So there's, you know, there's quite a bit of sand. Yeah. So the concept is to, and, to, to evacuate the, the salt or, or get it to move past the root zone, right? Correct. And, you know, there's other clubs in the area that are stripping and regrading with six to eight inches of sand. Well, we didn't want to do that. Right. One, it's quite expensive. And two, what are you going to do with the material? So right. we're doing it. 
a different way just over a longer period of time. Yeah. And, and I know you told me that, that, you know, prior to this, uh, to this program starting, you know, you get, you'd get good germination on your ryegrass in the fall and, and then it would turn black and curl up and die because it was, you know, it was taking up the salt indiscriminately between the salt and the, and the potassium. And, and it would just, you know, sodium induced wilt would take over and <laughs> you'd essentially lose your crop. And, and I remember you saying that after that first year, that, that the, the catch on ryegrass was way, way better. So I guess the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. I mean, we overseed for a reason. We don't do the 1,200 pounds of the acre anymore, you know, like in years past, but we're 800, 900 pounds of the acre. We overseed because we know we're going to have some deaths in the salt. But this last year, the golf course that we blacked, we only went out at 700 pounds and it was so good. Granted, we had some rain this year, yeah. but the, the overseed itself was so good. You know, we didn't lose much because the water had somewhere to go. So, um, when you look at the cost of ryegrass, the cost of gypsum and other other soil amendments versus the cost of the sand, I mean, in the long term, you're probably going to, do you think you'll be a wash or, or a little ahead of the game? I think we're going to be ahead because, you know, the, the initial thought was the shockwave and throw sand over a period of years. You know, I think that was going to cost over a million dollars where we decided to go with black and put all the sand, most of the sand down all at once, we're going to save, I can't remember what the number is, but it's going to be a, a shorter period with a greater savings because, you know, we're not continually buying sand and spending the labor to put the sand out year after year. Grant, we can still do it, but it's going to be down there. And then, you know, ryegrass is going up every year. So if we can start throwing a little bit less, yeah, you know, we'll just put that money somewhere else. Are you are you noticing uh, your water consumption going up or staying about the same or, or down a little bit? We're actually going down a little bit. Interesting. Um, we don't ever go off of what a book says, but you know, Toro sends you a sprinkler head with a set nozzle, and you should be using this <laughs> nozzle. Well, <laughs> some people do, and some people want to see if they can make it better. So we decided, you know, let's try some different nozzles, and by doing that. Um, we're more efficient and we're saving water. Got it. Because the, the more water we put out is also the more salt we put out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like you said. I mean, I've I've looked at your soil test. We've done some with you, and and uh, uh, you know, n- nobody in Arizona or or any of the desert Southwest really worries about greens because you can actually flush those. Whereas, you know, like you said, that the native soil, the parent material, doesn't doesn't afford you that opportunity. So you've got to do it some other way. Yeah, it's it's a good four inches of DG is a mixture of, of rock and clay. Right. So that it gets pretty locked up four inches down. Once you get below that four inch level, that's pretty good stuff. But that's the the issue is getting below that four inches. I've had to do soil samples before with a post hole driver. Yeah. That's how hard these soils can get. I know. <laughs> I can I can remember that for sure. So um <laughs> let's let's tack a little bit here and and get a little lighter because that's pretty heady stuff i want to get back into overseeding here in a minute but um uh, i've seen your cart and you're you know you're you you're proudly a a working superintendent like you said you like working on irrigation what's uh what's the one tool in your cart you can't do without probably my irrigation tools i mean i'm out there every day seeing why is this area wet or why is this area dry or how can we make this better so i have a a bin box full of nozzles and a little tool bag full of, of tools that I just go out and start messing around with sprinkler heads and just see if I can do something better. Right. Cool. Cool. Cause we're spending just under half a million dollars a year on water. Not, not the power or anything, just water for, for the two golf courses For two golf courses. And we, I think we use, you know, on average, we're under 400 acre feet a year, Okay, which is a lot of water. But yeah. And that's uh, that's probably less than Scottsdale, isn't it? Their water yeah. prices have gone up some. Yeah, they're uh, the the thirteen users on the the line are RO water now, so yeah. they, they're paying for it, but they're not putting out the amendments because they don't need to. That's right. That's right. Well, it's it's interesting that that you know that's another thing I think a lot of places in the country don't really realize is. You know, you look at the price of golf in Arizona, and you, if you're if you're not used to it, you think about that. But you know, before you've even uh, started up a mower, 
uh, the first of the year, you've already incurred a half a million dollars worth of worth of costs that nobody else has. And and electricity, I can remember electricity is not cheap either. So that just adds to it. Anything you can save there, yeah, money in your pocket, right? Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so let's get back to overseeding for a minute. And, and, uh, I, I want to, I've always, I've always found it fascinating. Um, and everybody does it a little bit differently. I want to talk about overseeding and also transition and how that's changed over the years. Cause when I left Arizona, um, you know, we were just kind of <laughs> letting nature take its course. And a lot of times it wasn't pretty. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, Seeding rates of, of perennial ryegrass between 750 and 1,000, maybe 1,200 pounds. Are you doing pre-emergence prior to? I know that was in vogue for a while. We do pre. We don't oversee our roughs, so we'll use a pre-emergent in the roughs just because we don't want, you know, poa or volunteer ryegrass popping up. Right. But as far as fairways go, no, we'll we'll spray uh, rim sulfur on on the fairways and greens and and teas you know, about 10 days prior to dropping seed. And that, that's been good. It, it cleans up whatever POA seeds there, but as far as a straight pre-emergent, we don't. Okay. But I've seen some good and bad with pre-emergence on overseeded rye and, you know, it can either help you or really hurt you. Well, and it certainly, uh, it certainly drives up the, the cost of seed too, because you've got to account for some loss, I think. And that's, you know, that's something I always kind of scratch my head on that, that, if you've got to crank it up and, and, you know, there's always, I've seen situations where some of the pre-emergence, even from the, from the roughs or the desert edges is bled into the areas where you've overseed and then nothing comes up. And now what do you do? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the process itself for, for preparation and uh, <clears throat> prior to the overseeding, um, How's that changed over the years? I, I know it used to be just a, a god awful mess. And are, are you doing things differently now? A little less disruptive? Yeah, I would say. Well, first, first, the ten, fifteen years ago at True North, it was you're going to the dirt. You're out there verticutting, and then you're taking four thousand and two twenty three Ds with no rollers on them. You're just scalping with a bed knife, and it's pretty much dirt. Right. And it's dusty, and it's it's a mess. And I think we would do. 30 40 yard dumpsters of waste per golf course just to get it ready to prep um, that's just getting rid of bermuda grass and now you know with the help of chemicals the lowest we go is 350 and we're doing two dumpsters per golf course from 30, we're using from 30 to two for two golf yeah. courses that's amazing and we're we're uh for the earlier golf course which we typically feed in the middle of september We'll go out with a light rate of uh, turflon, follow that up with some diquat just to burn the plant, and then we'll just mow it off, and we're good to go. And then the second course that's overseeded in the uh, middle of October, we just go out with diquat. We do put a heavy mm -hmm. rate of primo on prior to the diquat just to slow it down, and normally by then the, the nighttime temperatures are slowing the brewmeter down anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, we've that drastically reduced our, our haul off. Yeah. So, so to, to, to back up a little bit. So the, 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 the diquat goes on the Bermuda grass, right? So you're trying to defoliate as best you can, or at least slow it down so that that ryegrass has a chance to establish. Correct. Correct. Yeah. We're, we'll spray in the morning, let the sun do its job. You know, it turns a nice straw yellow and the next day we're mowing it off. We can do one golf course. We can spray it, scalp it and seed it in four days. Jeez. Yeah. How different is that? Okay. So, so you drop the seed, um, which, which is delivered in a lot of different ways, but are, are you guys seeding in house or are you contracting that or how do, how do you guys do it? We see, we do everything in house. Um, and like I said, we can do it in four days. Okay. And then once the seeds down, you start watering, is the golf course closed at that point? Yeah, we're closed. I think the early golf course were closed for five weeks and then the later golf course is three weeks. So we're, we're prepping seeding and growing in in three weeks and golfers are ready to play. And you know, there's some thin areas, but it gets better with time and they understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But three weeks, I mean, to think about planting a whole new crop and being, being ready for play in three weeks is pretty amazing. And I, I, I always marveled at that. It's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Okay. So you go through the winter, um, 
you got you got oodles of members out playing they're 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 happier than they've ever been uh now you come to this time of year or maybe just a, a couple weeks prior um uh, talk about transition past to present and how how that looks differently now transition's a nightmare you know there's just so many things that go into getting bermuda grass to come out of dormancy uh you're out there in february and if it's been a warm winter or warm february or something you're seeing some pop up you go, oh yeah this is gonna be a good transition you know you get into march and april and you're seeing some more and you're like yeah i don't think we're gonna have an issue this year and then uh, we sprayed out, we used a, a transition aid a couple weeks ago. We spray out and you know, as I told the members, it's going to be ugly. It's, it's just how it is because you're taking this nice lush ryegrass and you're going to Bermuda grass that's been under, you know, in the soil and underneath the ryegrass for seven months. And you're, you're hoping and praying that it's going to be there. And when you go spray out and that ryegrass starts dying and you start seeing bare spots, you're like, you know, February and March, they're just lying to you. But, you know, with everything that we've done in the past, you know, I was telling both the superintendents that, you know, the, the amount of Bermuda we have right now is normally what we see in July. You know, we've, we're doing something right. Um, whether it be we're, we're getting decent weather or changing nozzles or, you know, doing what we're doing to the soil, but transition isn't as ugly as it used to be. I'm, you know, that's this year, next year could be a different story because there's so many variables at play on getting that Bermuda that to one, store enough carbohydrates in the fall, but two, getting it to come out of dormancy at a, and, you know, at a rate that's going to make you happy. But like I said, we don't get good weather until July to yeah. get that Bermuda to spread out. Yeah. And I think that's something people don't understand unless you've lived there. I mean, it's, it's a, I know traditionally the first hundred degree week is, is usually the first week in May. And uh, you'd think, oh man, the Bermuda's got to be growing like gangbusters by now. But it it really isn't until that monsoon season hits and you get a little touch of humidity and things really start to wake up. It's it's a very short period of time to to grow to grow Bermuda grass. So so why why bother? You know, I could see somebody somebody in Maine listening to this saying, well, why bother even with the, with Bermuda grass in the first place? What's the point? Well, as, as we all remember in school, you have the C3s and the C4s. You know, C3s only can withstand 83 to 85 degree temperatures before they start shutting down. That's right. So our nighttime temperatures going forward don't get below 90. Yeah. So, yeah, we could probably keep ryegrass out there. It's not going to be pretty or cheap because they're going to be fertilizing and fungicides and just everything to keep it alive. Yeah. Uh, and the Bermuda grass allows you to one, reduce costs and go home at night, not thinking about, you know, what's going to die tomorrow. So, yeah, and some exactly. Some people are on the boat. It, right, Bermuda grass handles sodium a lot better than ryegrass. So, you know, if we can manage that Bermuda in the summer and have a good stand, like I said, that's where the ryegrass lives in the winter. It, yeah. It's hard to see ryegrass on bare dirt. Well, and that and that was one of the points I, I wanted you to make was was the fact that it's it's really a nurse plant and 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 it has to be there or that seed has nowhere to tack down and 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 reside before it germinates. And that's yeah, where a lot that's, of the problems it. came from in the past was that you know you'd have that bare dirt area and you can't seed into it because it just runs all over the place. Yep. Interesting. So yeah, we basically do two grow ins a year. You know, we have the fall right. grow in and then we have the spring grow in and you know. Neither one of them are easy. So if the club told you no, no transition aids, uh, would it be a lot harder to do what you're doing? As, as I tell them, it wouldn't be harder. It's just going to be uglier for a longer period of time. And, 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 and longer, know. yeah. Yeah, and I told them we need 90 to 100 days of good Bermuda weather to have a good overseed. You know, if you, if you relate everything to overseed, it kind of perks their interest more. Than if you're just saying we want good Bermuda in the summer because most of them aren't here in the summer. Right. They all go back home to the Midwest. So if, if we say it's going to make our overseed much better, then they kind of listen a little bit more. No better interest than self interest, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. So, so if, if we didn't use transition aids, we'll just go out there and airify and yeah. take it out with the heat and the, the wear and tear. More interruption and more, more pain in the process for sure. Yep. Yeah. So I know you're active on, on, on social media, especially Twitter. Um, 
And I saw I saw you post something the other day that you you really felt pretty good about your Bermuda gray, Bermuda grass base coming back. And um, so my question is, did you invent the hashtag pound sand? No, it was a Greens Committee member. I can't remember what we were talking about. But he, in passing, he said, just go out there and pound the sand. I mean, all right, I'll just run with it. <laughs> so, so you didn't invent it, but you're definitely, you're definitely taking credit for it, uh, kind of being, being in the mainstream now. Yeah, he's not on the Greens Committee anymore, so I'll take it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, in your case, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that that was the right thing to do and and, uh, you know, like I said earlier, the proof is in the pudding and smart way and for the young superintendents that, that are, are trying to find ways to, to, you know, convince, uh, the decision makers in, in clubs, uh, you know, what you did on number six and use that as the test bed for, for the, for your theory and for the process. Uh, you know, I, I know you and I've spoken before about this, but it was, it was the best sales tool you could have presented because they, they saw it was a night and day difference in, in a pretty short period of time. So that's pretty darn good advice uh, for, for people just getting a start in the business. Where, where do you see golf in five years? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, I don't play as much golf as I probably should. I mean, I haven't played golf in a year, but it, it's just, you know, my generation and there are people that play golf, but, there's other things to do as well. I mean, I'd rather go home and, and spend it with my kids or my family or go do something else. And, you know, I've been on the golf course all day and I don't want to go out and play golf, but in the future, I don't know. I mean, with what's going on now, it's kind of scary because, you know, just the, the amount of changes that people have implemented to deal with what's going on and, you know, younger people just aren't playing. So the older generation. I don't know. I don't think there is a, a solution because, you know, you can only follow Tiger Woods so much or some of the younger kids. But uh, I think you've got to start looking at, you know, like they've tried to do the foot golf or shorter rounds. You know, you've got the youngsters out there now with all their music going and you've just got to adapt to what the generations are doing to, to keep it moving forward. Right. Totally agree with you. I was, I was shocked. I heard a, Actually, I think I was listening to a podcast, and, and they said that last year, 50 million people participated in a, in a top golf event. 50 million people. And to me, you know, that's, you know, you talk about music on the golf course and some of the, maybe the the generational shifts that we've seen in, in our society. I, I think you're absolutely right. We got, we've got to be able to adapt to some of that stuff. And, and if we can't jump on board with things like top golf and uh, which to me seems like a great gateway into the game. Um, you know, we're probably going to miss the boat. It's interesting. I mean, the people that, that you and I know that, you know, grew up the older generation, I mean, they're, they're prim and proper, they're collared shirts, they're suit and tie in the clubhouse. You know, that's great for some areas of the country, but if you want to get the average golfer involved, you know, just come out with your, your shirt and your shorts, no, no tank top, no shirts off, but you got to adapt to what, kids these days are doing yeah yeah did you just did you just put the both of us in the older generation did you just slip that i think in there? so oh man i think so <laughs> well this interview's over <laughs> no but you're right you're right it's it's uh and and i see uh, you know i travel quite a bit and i i see clubs that have adapted and and have have relaxed some of their some of their stodgy old rules and 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 you can feel the vibe it's different and and they're they're active and and it's a good thing i think uh, you know the the more adaptable we can be in the game i think the better off we'll be in the long in the long run um so yeah, I mean, so how would you if you, if you could find a new assistant coming in coming into the business what advice would you give them at this point because things a lot lots changed in the last 20 25 years yeah i mean it's hard to find a good assistant anymore it's, it's and we all know this job it's it's hard work it's it's busy work but at the end of the day if you can look out on the golf course and see what you did and you know it's going to be there tomorrow and it's not the end of the world if it's not then you know you've just got to put your nose to it and just do the best job you can you're going to learn them some, some things on your own by doing that you know there's people here to help but you know a lot of the stuff I've learned or done, I've just decided to go out and do it just to see what would happen. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to be a, a 
a common sense kind of guy and a guy that's not afraid to take risks because you know it, it will fail and it'll fail fast, but you know, it gets better over time. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I always told the guys that work for me that, you know, nothing good happens fast. Anything worthwhile takes a little bit of time, but, but you got to be willing yeah. to make those mistakes and learn from them. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's all those salesmen out there that are selling the next best thing. And, you know, I've tried them and they don't work and I tell them they don't work and it's all you just didn't do it right. Well, you know, you don't know until you try it and you put it side by side with something else. So like right. I said, it will fail, but you know, if you find the right situation, it could get better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I, I, uh, I don't have any more questions, Travis. You got anything you want to add? You know, you got the whole yeah, world you know, or, or, or 10 of our closest friends, one of the two. Yeah. You know, kind of going backwards a little bit, but you know, dealing with sodium, I think before I got here, they're doing eight gypsum apps a year and which, you know, gypsum is gypsum. It's calcium sulfate. It, it changes pH. It's, it, you know, it's an easily readily available form of calcium, but you know, I, I tried to, putting lime out and i got a lot of uh negative negativity coming back because you know our water and our soil they say well you're going to make concrete well you know how do you know until you try because that's what the textbooks tell you right so we've started going out the last three years putting lime out just one half a year we're not doing it for ph reasons we're doing it you know you think about polyon and the slow release fertilizers we're doing it as slow release calcium because calcium carbonate with the addition of acid converts itself to gypsum over a period of time. That's right. So we've reduced our gypsum applications. We're doing one gypsum a year and one lime a year, and we're still maintaining 65 to 70% base saturation. Yeah. And the, and, and, and the concept there is just to try to stay ahead of the sodium, however you can do it. And, and I think that's, you know, that's something a lot of, a lot of people don't understand is it's not about pH in that case. It's about, making in your case it's making a, a corrective measure in the soil right yeah because we'll never be able to change our ph because our water is nine five to ten that's so, right you know we're putting putting that much water out at night i mean you could probably get your ph down over time but it's not going to be anything good to look at well it looks like i'm looking at one of your tests from a couple of years ago and it looks like you know you've you've rebounded to the mid sevens so you know, again, just like your water, there's a there's a sweet spot that that soil basically naturally wants to get to, and and that's probably about where it is. So, um, yeah, and we only pH inject just, inferic acid. Okay, we we inject inferic acid sparingly, we a couple of times a year just to to kind of get it out there because we don't want x with non draining soils. We're just adding up the sulfate, so you right. know, we've got some areas out there that don't drain and they stink. Um, but uh, you just keep, I think our, our thing going forward is just keep disrupting the soil and adding sand to a, a soil that doesn't drain and just keep moving things around. Yep, exactly. Well, like we've said, the proof is in the pudding. I've been to your property several times and, and uh, have had an opportunity to see it kind of midstream and, and not the end result, but, but certainly, uh, certainly some improvements. So keep on, uh, keep on the path. You're doing a great job. Um, uh, our guest today has been Travis Blameyers. Uh, Travis, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate it. Uh, I understand Thank the you. weather's been a little bit cooler the last few days, so that's good. I know you're going to get hot again, but uh, with heat comes good transition. So thanks so much for your time, it's Travis. Just, thank you. And it's been uh, a pleasure. Yeah, and, and one of these days I'll get back down and see you when I'm allowed to travel again. Arizona is the place to be. The heat kills it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. 